Hello and welcome to the WMTG podcast. Hello. I am Steve. And I am Alan. And we are the Winall family. And we love all things Magic the Gathering, so we are going to come up with some interesting topics for discussion between the two geeks that are us. Yeah, we're doing a Would You Rather style discussion. Yes, today on WMTG, Would You Rather, The Magic the Gathering edition. So we just kind of, uh, on our own, created a few questions, a few scenarios, and we're Mm going to just pose them. It's like, would you rather, in the magic sense. Uh, So now, we each sort of came up with eight, but they're not... um, they, they range from pretty simple to pretty complex, I think. Mm-hmm. I don't really know what you did. Yeah, mine, mine are some complex, some pretty silly. Okay, but well, that's fine. We're here to have fun. Yeah, uh, that's that's all we're doing. Mm-hmm. Uh, so tell you what, I want to start off because I want to try and set the tone here. Okay. Um, so this is now, right now I don't have any qualifiers on that. This is just, this is like the, this is round one of Would You Rather Magic the Gathering edition. All right. All right, so simple, simple one to start. Would you rather play one game that lasts for three hours or six games in one hour? Hmm. Okay. I guess I'd... Ooh, six games in one hour, those are pretty quick. Yeah, that, that average is about... That, that's ten minutes a game. Yeah. That's like, you know, two aggro decks pounding it out or an aggro and a combo deck that's used to going off on turn three or four. You know, th- those are those are pretty swift matchups. But, oh, I mean, the drawback is, like, to one or the other, like, in, in six games in an hour, you might be trading wins back and forth. Yeah, honestly, I feel like a three-hour game might be more satisfying. You think so, huh? Yeah, because if you win it, you get bragging rights, but if you lose it, you're still like, hey... This was a pretty good game. (laughs) I held on for three hours. Yeah. (laughs) Right, yeah. Actually, yeah, the reason I came up with that question, um, well, I mean, because I I think I've been in both of those scenarios. Uh, You know, I've done done the thing where it's like, oh, we've we've both got really strong decks, let's just play for a while, and then just bam, 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 and they just go back and forth for a long time. But I was in a tournament once, and this is like, it was a store tournament, but this was way before the days of rigidly timed rounds and things like that. And this, this store was like, I don't care if we're open till three in the morning. Let's just sit here and play. You know? uh, we, we apologize for the dogs in the background. They have no sense of decorum or, you know, quiet. Being while quiet. We're on the air. <laughs> um, but yeah, I was I wound up in the finals of one of the games. And. Both of us had a blue white control deck. Oh, and this was back in the days before. Before there was such a thing as modern, it was before, I think it was probably even before extended. This is back when the deck Counterpost was a big thing. Mm. You know, Blue White Control has existed ever since the early days of Magic, right? But for a long time, there was a version of it that was called Counterpost. It, you know, over time, it graduated into Land Still, you know, but it was Blue White. There have been different incarnations of of Blue White Control. Yeah, I can can see how that would last three hours. Yeah, well, this one, this particular incarnation of it i think was particularly slow because Mm. the reason it was called counterpost is that really its only win condition was a land card called keldoran outpost which is just a card that cranks out a one one soldier token every time you pay three and tap it and the rest of the deck was primarily removal and counter spells hence counterpost you know sometimes Mm. people would throw in Additional win conditions like Mishra's Factory that was, you know, on another land that was part of the mana base, but it could also attack as a creature. Every now and then someone would throw in a single copy of, like, Rainbow of Freet or something like that. Like, a flying blue creature that you could pay two blue and phase out. You know, so it was really, really hard to kill. But there was only one, maybe two in the deck. So it had very few win conditions. All control. And card advantage back then was not like, you know, they're... (laughs) <laughs> there are 300 cards that could draw you more cards. You know, No, it was like you were limited to, well, I've got four copies of Impulse and, and four copies of Brainstorm. 
and brainstorm might not have even been legal and standard. It wasn't even Whoa. called standard. So, I mean, you're, you're, and you had like thawing glaciers. Jeez. That was how you got your land out. And you, so the games just lasted forever. You know, you the that, game, that game has sped up exponentially. A lot. Yeah, since the game then. has sped up a lot since then. But this was the kind of thing where this deck, if it won. It never won fast. If everything was working perfectly efficiently and this thing won absolutely as fast as it could possibly win, you're still talking like a really long game. <laughs> and we had two of those types of decks up against each other in the finals. The game, I believe, lasted three and a half hours. <sighs> I finally wound up winning. Hey! And yeah, yes, go me. Yay. But we were we were both completely exhausted by the end of it, and we were both oh. like, okay, honestly, that was like because there was some really deep. It was a chess match, you know. There was some deep next level stuff going on. So the like whole game. next level mind games. It was the kind of thing where we we're both playing very reactive decks, and so when the other one isn't doing anything that you, for you to react to, it comes down to okay, he's got a single Mishra's factory on the board that's attacking me, and my only way to kill it right now is a Navinerals disc. Oh. So I have to somehow resolve a Navinerals disc and then make sure it survives for a whole turn until I can untap it so that when he attacks his, with his Mishra's factory, I can destroy it. So that'll stop the attacks from Mishra's factory because you wouldn't attack with the factory knowing it's just going to get blown up from the disc, right? It was something like that. I don't know. Maybe they had a bunch of soldier tokens out. I don't know. But it came down to a point of, okay, he's played this many counterspells, I've played that many counterspells, there's only one Navinerals disc left in the game, he has this many cards in hand, I have this many cards in hand, so Ugh. I have to make sure that if I play this disc and he plays a counterspell, I have enough mana to play my own counterspell, and then when he plays his second counterspell, I have enough mana to play my second counterspell. Yeah, that that sounds like next level mind game. Yeah, it was. It, it it became a math game of trying to figure out exactly how many counterspells the other person could still have left in their deck, uh, what the likelihood of you know having several of them in your hand was, how much mana they had. To cast those cards, hmm. you know, whether or not they were holding the force of will. I mean, it, it, there was a lot of, yeah, long game, really interesting. So, right. uh, but, but, but you're not sure if you would, you, you went three hour game. Though. Yeah, I went, went three, three hour, hour game. game. And obviously I, I we're think talking, it would be pretty satisfying. Though. Yeah, we're, we're, and we're talking completely casual game too, because mm -hmm. obviously if you're in a tournament, they're, they're not going to let you. You're not going to get a three hour game. It's never yeah, they're gonna not going to let you do that. Right. Okay. So that was, that was my first one. But okay. here, let, let me expand these next two questions here. And okay. then, and then I'm going to hand it over to you. Cause this is, this is my preliminary round, right? Mm -hmm. All right. Good. These, we're not going to spend as much time <laughs> on these next ones. I don't think so, but no. here's my next question. Okay, uh, a, a little background on it. Okay, so you're in a tournament. Mm -hmm. You're sitting down to a tournament. Well, you could say it's a big tournament either, you know, even. And uh, so you're sitting down to your opponent, and obviously you want a good matchup for every single one of your, your games. Mm -hmm. Would you rather look across the table to see a kid, uh, say, 9 to 12 years old? Okay. Or an adult who is clearly 60 or 70. Moral thing. Yeah, okay. this, is, this is a little more of a moral question. This is more of a magic scruples question. Because this is sort of asking you to profile hmm. just based on a demographic, based on what you can see. Well, given that I'm still a young person myself, mm -hmm. I I guess I would rather I'd rather want to see a kid there. Just because it's closer to your own peer group? Yeah. Mostly just because of that. Okay. So it's nothing to do with anything like uh, whether or not you thought the kid would be better at the game or the adult would be better at the game. You wouldn't think like, well, the adult's more experienced and has more uh, intellectual capacity and therefore would be a harder opponent. Or, you know, you think no, the I kid would be I easier. I didn't think any of that because... You know, that didn't factor be, into it? To be honest... I've seen some pretty stupid adults. <laughs> and I've seen some pretty smart kids. Well, haven't we all? <laughs> yeah, and I've seen some pretty smart kids. Uh -huh. So, you shouldn't really judge someone's intellect based on how old or young they are. Well, I think, yeah, that is that is a very good point. And, you know, the true, and I think what you're saying is you can't tell just by looking at them. Yeah. So you never really know. You, you never know. 
So you're really thinking in terms of who would I be more comfortable playing against? Yeah. Okay. All right. That makes sense. Yeah. And I thought about that too. And I, I honestly don't know because I think we can't, we can't help but do a little bit of profiling when we sit down, you know, mm-hmm. and, and a lot of people tend to engage, you know, and they, they, they ask you a bunch of questions like, Hey, how are you? What's your name? How long you've been playing this game? You know, yeah. and then they're just being friendly and stuff. But there's a small part in the back of your mind that says, you know, they're, they're fishing for information. They're yeah. trying to, they're trying to see how comfortable they are playing me and whether or not they think they have anything to worry about. Or if they can be so casual that they can get me to reveal something about what I'm playing. Yeah. or I don't see as much of that nowadays as <laughs> like, there used to be. Sometimes I'll be across the table from my opponent and they'll say, so how long have you been playing? And I'll say, oh, since Return to Ravnica came out. And that would leave me at around 12 years old. Mm-hmm. And yeah, to put this in context, yeah. Ixalan just hit the shelves. Yes. <laughs> so Return to Ravnica has been quite a while now. Yeah. And sometimes they will be less experienced than me and I'll see their eyes widen in <laughs> like, kind of fear. You're you're a young person. How could you have been playing this game that long? <laughs> yeah, no, I get yeah, that. Yeah, I've seen that and like you really shouldn't be that afraid. <laughs> yeah. And I, I have to confess to being a little bit guilty of, of trying to uh, to use my level of experience as an intimidation factor. <laughs> I often love going in there and saying to people, I'll bet my DCI number is the lowest in the room. <laughs> I've heard <laughs> you say that. Yeah, because I've, because I've been playing for 20 numbers. years. Yeah. <laughs> it's only six digits. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's you know, there's there's nobody I play against who has been playing the game as long as I have. Well, no, I mean, you've been playing since the beginning. Well, almost like a yeah. year after it came out. Yeah. All right. So I got one more in my, my opening round category here. All right. Um, this is a little bit different. This is sort of the uh, the outside game situation. This okay. is this is the broader term of magic. OK. Uh, congratulations. You just won twenty dollars in store credit. OK. Would you rather spend that store credit? On ten two dollar cards, or one twenty dollar card. Hmm. I'd say one twenty dollar card. You're going for the power. Mm hmm. Yeah. Because usually that twenty dollar card is gonna be pretty powerful. Yeah. And I would try and find ways to put that in my decks. Yeah. Ten two dollar cards. You could get more cards out of it, but you don't know how useful they're going to be in comparison to the $20 card. Yeah, and I guess sometimes you don't mind, you know, well, I'll do the store credit. I'll do the store credit for $20, but, you know, I, I don't mind shelling out a couple bucks, you know, maybe $4 to get two of those $2 cards yeah. and throw those in as well. Yeah, that, I was kind of in the same, the same boat. And I've done it both ways, actually. I've mm-hmm. been in that situation before, and I've done it both ways. There, there have been so times. So these where... questions are mostly coming from personal experience. Uh, sometimes, yeah. I mean, I didn't think of anything specific on that one. Uh, although the last time we played in the store, I did earn some store credit, and I did put it all into a single card. Yeah, you um, got the what, multicolored what, Nissa. Yeah, it wasn't wasn't twenty dollars by any stretch, but <laughs> you know, it was, but it was, it was a little a bit of store spot. credit. And it was like eh, I could get three boosters. Or I could get that one nice card that I really want and mm-hmm. I don't feel like spending 7 or $8 on, you know. All right. So should I do three of my yeah, questions Yeah, let's, let's hear what you got. I want to – all right. Hit, me with, a, hit all right. me with a would you rather. All right. My first question is very situational. Okay. But – all right. Here we go. You use an ability that lets you scry during your first main phase. There you see a doubling season and you leave it on top, knowing you have a planeswalker, Ugin the Spirit Dragon, in hand, <laughs> who could go immediate, ultimate immediately with doubling season in play. Oh boy, that's one of my favorite things ever. <laughs> you have enough mana to cast both. You have four other cards in hand and you have an ability in play that allows you to draw a card, but you'd have to discard a card at random to do it. Ooh. Would you use the ability, knowing you have a one in five chance Ooh. of losing your planeswalker? Wow, what a great that scenario. was the first oh, one I came oh up my with. Gosh. <laughs> so you you could do it right now, but possibly lose Ugin. Yeah, or you could or do it wait later. a turn and definitely get it. Yeah. Wow, that's fantastic. 
That so okay, so you have you have an effect that would allow you to to draw. Okay, so you have like a loot effect. Yeah. Basically, like a, I don't know, you get like some merfolk looter or something like that. An ability to draw a card, but you have to discard a card at random to do it. At random. Oh, that, okay, that's an important distinction. So it's not like a, a a typical loot. There's a random discard that has to happen. Mm-hmm. We won't question what's making that happen. This just that's the scenario. Mm-hmm. Okay, and and realistically, you could be talking about. Any two combo cards. And I'm assuming this is like a commander thing where, or a Highlander t- style thing where you've only got one copy of each card and no real easy way to get it back well, right away. You can interpret that how you want. So, or maybe you're just on a clock. Yeah, they're, maybe they're, they're you're just you on a clock. Yeah, yeah. okay. That's right, what so, I kind of thought, you're on a clock. So, wow. This is, that's a tough scenario because, I, I mean, obviously all these are going to depend on certain factors. Mm-hmm. You know, like how much time do I really, you know, can I wait for a turn um, is there a possibility I might lose the card off the top of my deck? Could I get milled? Is there a possibility uh, I could lose cards in my hand anyway? Mm-hmm. Or something will happen to my lands or my ability to to cast it? Um, also, I mean, you said we have enough mana... To cast both. To cast both, but that doesn't really specify whether or not we would then have the ability to do anything else. So we don't really know mm-hmm. what we'd be getting off of Ugin when we go ultimate... I tried you know. to make it like as interpretable as possible. Right, yeah. And and you know, again, Ugin is the ultimate is draw seven cards, gain seven life, and put seven permanents from your hand into play. Into play, into the battlefield. Yeah. So that could be so you could get more land. Wow. You know, I think I might risk it. Uh, I really think I mean I was I mean, kind of thinking the same thing too. Yeah, I mean it's I think there's a definite argument for that being powerful enough to wait for a turn and make sure that, like cuz you can keep your mana open and maybe react to stuff or at least bluff like you're reacting to stuff, mm-hmm. but that's such a powerful effect that I I might risk it. And you know if yeah, one in five chance is not good <laughs> of, yeah. of you know losing the Ugin. And okay, well this is an important distinction though. Are are we are we drawing the card first and then doing a random discard? We're doing the ra- the random discard first. Okay, because that's that's important because it, so basically the cost of the effect is discard, discard a card, the at, card random, at random, draw a card. Okay, mm-hmm. yeah, because otherwise then you could then you've got both pieces in your hand and you could lose and you could either lose one either of one of them. And yeah, that's not good. So yeah, I, I, in that scenario, I think I might risk it. I yeah. think that'd be, because that would be fun anyway, yeah. just to be able to say that, yeah, I got it. Even if you miss, it's like, oh, look what I almost did. You yeah. Know? <laughs> sure. It would be a fun scenario. Oh, yeah, that was a good one. All right. Question two. Question two. In a one-on-one commander game, would you rather face your Yisan deck or your Thracios deck? <laughs> okay, well, this is very specific to me. Yep. Um, Yisan, I think, is a is a pretty ubiquitous strategy and that people have seen it before it's that's that's a lot of people consider that a tier one commander strategy mm-hmm. it's a very competitive commander deck that when built properly and played properly it can win by like turn three or something well not quite that fast but it consistently wins by turn five or six uh mm-hmm. if you do nothing to stop it it's always going to tempo out perfectly the same way every single time yeah. and and win with like i don't know like a thousand ant tokens or whatever it is that, mm-hmm. that it does you know uh, so because that's that's the value of Yisan is that it's, you know, you're always going to, it's going to go off on the first activation, the second activation, you know, you're going to get the pro- the same creatures in the same progressive order. So it's a very reliable deck. Um, it's a nasty one, but we're one-on-one, right? You did mention mm-hmm. that. It's one-on-one. one-on-one, one-on-one so this game. is dual commander um, mm-hmm. or the Thracios deck. And, you know, I don't know. I've never seen those two decks against each other. Uh, the Thracios deck, um, I've seen a lot of different incarnations of Thracios. Um, specifically yours. Specifically mine. Okay, mine uh, focuses very much on... It's kind of a combo engine. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a number of different ways to combo out. Mostly, it tries to go for infinite mana. Um, mm-hmm. And it, it can do that in a number of ways with, like, uh, Illusionist Bracers on... Uh, I don't know what, a Feto Alchemist plus an artifact or a, a mana-producing mm-hmm. creature... Or it can do it by, um, there is another way to do it with like Tide Spout, Tyrant, plus Sol Ring, plus Mana Vault. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, there's a number of different ways to create infinite mana in there. And what makes Thracios so good with that is that Thracios has an activation cost, which allows you to scry and then either put a land directly in play, or if it's not a land, 
put it into your hand after you reveal it off the top of your deck. And the great thing about it is if you've got infinite mana, you don't even need your commander in play to do this because, you know, the commander for yeah. could have been killed 14 times and cost an extra 28 to bring it out. They could be could cost you 30 mana to bring Thracios back into play to start using it abil- its ability, but it doesn't tap to do it. So you have infinite mana, just do it and start scry. You can scry your whole deck. You can put every land into play. It'll all come in tapped. But there's other things in there like Paradox Engine. Which, you know, <laughs> so you can, you can untap it. It's pretty everything. nasty. Yeah, and there are a whole lot of combos in that deck. And mm-hmm. it's a really, really fast, nasty value engine deck. And I don't know. I've never put those two decks against each other. So I can't say how they would do against each other. But the, but the question was... In a one-on-one commander game, would well, you rather face your Yeast on deck or your Thracios deck? Oh, boy. So you don't have to have them both against each other. Right, right. So it's whatever I've got, would I, what would I rather be up against? I think that is a little situation depending on what I'm playing. But as a general rule, I think I'd rather go up against Yisan. Okay. Because at the very least, I know I can disrupt Yisan. Thracios is hard to disrupt because, like I said, it it doesn't necessarily rely on the commander to do everything. It's mm. just that the commander at some point becomes a piece of the combo. Yeah. It can be in the command zone and you can still end up getting infinite mana, putting it into play and drawing your whole deck. So, yeah, if I kill Yisan, Yisan can come back, of course. You can recast it and, and that deck has a whole lot of mana to bring it back out again. But it's still going to have summoning sickness unless I would have something like a lightning reef. Mm-hmm. Easier to disrupt. Thracios doesn't even have to be in play in order for that to just go off and win. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I think my answer to that is Yisan. All right. And the third question, and then we're going to hand it back off to you. Okay. Is when picking cards from packs in a draft, would you rather pick a bomb rare outside your colors or a useful card in your colors? Ooh, wow. Uh, I think... Oh, man. I, I think the the correct answer to that... If you're just going according to the strategy of the game, the correct answer is you want the useful card that's in your color. Um, that that takes like the willpower of someone who doesn't need cards. Though <laughs> I, I frequently need cards, and I don't like letting bomb rares go. And yeah, there is an element of also you don't want that to table either. You no. don't want someone else to pick that up and use it against you. Because um, that would hurt. Yes, I mean, it does depend on the bomb rare. Uh, you know, I, I very frequently let some really good-looking cards go by simply because I can't use them, and I know it's there. other people aren't necessarily going to be able to use them either. Uh, I recently mm-hmm. did a draft where a couple of people passed some of the really nice dual lands that mm-hmm. were going by, you know, and these were like $5 rare cards. When you're really trying to put together a good yeah. deck, you don't want to pick it up too was... many dead cards. And there has been at least one instance where I picked up a card that I just could not let go. And I actually wound up playing it in my deck. It, it was mm-hmm. it was a really late pick. It was like the... the uh, first card of the last booster, Mm. you know, and I was at that point, I think heavily committed to like, I don't know, it was probably like white red or white black or something like that. And I opened up uh, a Johnny mentor of heroes and you know, I was, that's where you got that. Yeah. Oh yeah. Opened it in the draft, but it was like, Oh my, I cannot let that go. No No. way. There's no way I can let that go. And, and then I started thinking, well, I've already got white. Can I justify putting green in here? And then I thought that card is so powerful. Yeah. I have to splash green for it. (laughs) And I mean, that was a little easier because you know, if it was, you know, if I was in, like blue red or something like that and a Johnny mentor of yours comes out, Ugh. then it becomes a bit harder to justify because you know, you're not playing that in your deck. Yeah. Even then ah, it would have been really tough to let that go because I wouldn't have let that well, go. Well, not just because, I mean, at that point you can, you can comfortably say, you know, even if you've got a whole play set of Johnny's, you know, or, or, you, or you got a stack of them at home and you don't need the card. There is a point where you say to yourself, I really don't want to face that card in the draft. No, this is still this is the first card of the last booster. There's all kinds of useful stuff in here. But do you really want to go up against something? I that's don't want really, to go really up powerful? against an Johnny in a well, draft. And in, in a draft in a 40 card deck like a Johnny, that's huge amounts of card advantage. That'll get right to your, the middle ability. will get right to your creatures like it'll yeah. beef up all your other creatures for its and top since ability. It's a 40 card deck. It's unlikely you'll ever go ultimate 
with it, but that's gross if that ever happens. But, <laughs> you know? But if it's a 40 card deck, you're most likely going to see it in a lot of games. Yeah, yeah. And it's, yeah, you don't want to go up against it. And yeah, that would be a hard one to go. It would be nasty. But that's a tough question. Yeah, mm-hmm. I think it's very situational because uh, there's different levels of bomb, too. You know, if it's. If it's a bomb card, there's I think there's a difference between bomb card in a draft versus bomb card in a constructed format. Mm-hmm. Like something that's a bomb in a draft might never see constructed play. Yeah. You know? um, and vice versa. Yeah. You know, so it's, now it's your turn. Oh, all right. Well, let me go to a different. Now, I'm going to ramp things up a little bit. Um, this is this is sort of a category with three different scenarios in it. Mm-hmm. So here's the category. Let's assume you can get one free effect. Okay. On every opponent's turn. Ooh. So uh, now you can, you're either in a duel or in a group game. Doesn't matter. Every opponent's turn, you're getting one free effect. Effect you don't have to pay for. You don't have to expend a card for. You get a free effect. Okay? okay. So that's that's the basis for all of these questions here. Okay. So getting one free effect every turn, would you rather draw a card whenever they draw a card or untap whenever they untap? Untap whenever they untap. Yeah, I think that's my answer too. I mean, being able to draw a card whenever they like in a group game, like a like a multiplayer commander game, mm-hmm. like every time somebody draws, if you're drawing more cards, that's a huge, it's a huge, huge deal. deal. Yeah, and but at the same time, cards like profit it of does crew like consecration fix. sphinx, I think does it. But yeah, yeah, or, profit of crew fix or seedborn muse. Yeah, and and I have to confess that seedborn muse, at least right now, is probably my all time favorite creature. <laughs> it's easily, you know, if I were to look at every creature I've ever liked in the game, it's easily top five. Uh, it's just a fantastic ability. It was briefly eclipsed by Prophet of Crufix mm-hmm. um, because that was <laughs> even better. Um, yeah, because it then, had Flash. Well, it it, it gave all of your cards. Yeah, you could get Flash out of it and mm-hmm. you would untap. Yeah, but then Prophet of Crufix rotated out of Standard and got banned in Commander. But Seedborn Muse is... If that was le- any any format that's legal in, I'm going to try and play it. I mean, mm-hmm. you can't really justify it in a lot of things like, you know, legacy, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's just, that's insane. Mm. But such I don't a strong card. Play legacy. Yeah, so being able to untap all your stuff whenever anybody else untaps, and, you know, that, by the way, shuts down a lot of combos, too. Because uh-huh. if they start going out, I'm going to do this and then untap it and do this. Thing. And if you're doing if you're untapping every time they do it, then they're going to slow <laughs> down and start thinking. And it's like, how much advantage am I giving the person across the table from me? It's like, you know, I could be holding a counter spell. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, or, or any number of different things. You know, I could flash in a creature. I could capsize with buyback. I could, you know, mm-hmm. I just tapped out everything on my turn to do a big, huge turn of permanence but now you're letting me untap so i'm gonna cyclonic rift you know? oh. <laughs> there's a whole kinds of nasty things going on. yeah so i think uh. i think untapping whenever they untap is my answer to that too. yeah so here's the next one okay same same category you're still getting one free effect every opponent's turn mm-hmm. would you rather deal two damage to any target or tap any two permanents hmm Honestly, I think I'd rather tap down their permanence. Mm, interesting. I think that's my answer, too. It, it's very tempting to go with two damage to any target because that's, you know, having a shock, a free shock every turn to, like, that's get rid of a small good. threat or just continually time, put damage pressure on your opponent is also great. But, but <laughs> it could be useless in some situations. I don't know that it's ever useless. I mean, it, any target means you could just send it right at their face. You know, if, if they know they're getting shocked every single turn, you know, that that starts to add up. But at the same time, tapping down their permanence could mean locking down a combo they could potentially have. It could mean a lot of things. I think ultimately it's a lot more versatile mm-hmm. because you can shut them out of a color by tapping a couple of lands. You could yeah. keep two creatures out of combat or you could, you know, if you want to put pressure on them you can get do blockers out of the way mm. you know you can keep them from uh reacting at instant speed with an artifact effect or you know there's yeah. a lot of you ways could, that's useful like tap down their commander and like keep them from <laughs> doing tap effects yeah you could do that yeah i think that's also probably my answer okay mm-hmm. last one last one in this particular category one free effect on every opponent's turn would you rather Mill four cards from your opponent's deck or steal one of their permanents. Steal one of their permanents? Really? (laughs) Is that, oh wait, is that your answer or is that, uh, 
If it's a permanent effect, then I'd then I'd probably go with you the mean permanent. being able to you Just, get one you mean in getting the free effect on your opponent's turn yeah yeah you, this happens every opponent's turn no I mean like if taking the permanent is a permanent effect. Like, yeah, it just it means you're you're gaining control of target permanent. That's the effect. So not until end of turn. Or no, anything. not until end of turn. No Jeez. other qualifiers. You are gaining control of target permanent. I will take control of the permanent because <laughs> that means I could take their planeswalker. Yeah. And I gotta admit, um, or their one, commander. Yeah, this one was kind of a tough one for me. I'm sort of leaning towards steal the permanent, but at the same time, I think it's I think it's situational on the, the type of deck or the type of game that you're in. Like if you're in a if you're in a, a game like a draft or something or a sealed deck, you know, where you're playing a 40 card deck, milling four cards from them every single that turn. That would be pretty good. It's devastating. <laughs> Absolutely I, I devastating. I actually milled something out by milling half their deck in a sealed game before. Yeah, it's easier to do if you have that kind of a thing. I mean, it's harder to stay alive and support that sort of thing. It's not always easy to run a mill strategy in, in sealed. In sealed, yeah. But, but when you have, you know, a 60 card deck or. If you get to mill four cards for free every single turn, that's one of the reasons Jace Memory Adept is such a powerful card because zero, mill ten cards. Ugh, that's, six turns, they're yeah, dead. It just sits there and mills ten cards. That's brutal. That's really brutal. And They'd have to try and get rid of Jace before anything else. Yeah, they because it's at the very, very least, it's massive amounts of removal. Yeah, and it's a win condition. Well, it's definitely I've a win used, condition. I've used it as a win condition. Yeah, of course it is, but it's definitely a win condition. But milling cards is is removal mm -hmm. because you're denying them things that they could be drawing that they could be useful. You, they might be lands. You might be getting rid of lands that they desperately need. Yeah. Or maybe they've been sitting back, I need to get rid of that creature somehow, and you're milling all of their removal spells. <laughs> you know, I mean, there, there's a lot of reasons why that's, you know, and that really adds up. And every single turn, if they maybe know... Maybe they're waiting for that hero's downfall to try and get rid of the Jace, and then it's like, oops, yeah. there goes the hero's downfall. And while downfall. it could be frustrating for you them to for you to steal a permanent from them every single turn, you know... That's something I feel they could still get her. I mean, they they yeah. could they could probably catch. I mean, it, it's it's bad. It's very bad because they know anything they put down there is potentially the just fodder here's, for. You here's know. the thing: we play commander a lot, mm -hmm. and we haven't played any other format besides draft in a while. And I don't think that's going to change for a while. Uh, we we so primarily do draft and yeah, commander. Yeah, I'm thinking more in a commander mindset now. Sure. So that's why I think stealing a permanent every turn. Oh, agree. In good. in in a multiplayer game, I think I'm going with the with the with the permanent yeah. steal for sure. Because I mean, this is I it, I didn't really specify this. Pro, I didn't say target opponent. I'm saying every opponent's turn. Mm -hmm. You know, if you have that's effectively like um that's like a blatant thievery every that you're turn. casting <laughs> like every round at least not for every free. not every turn, but every round you're getting something from every opponent. <laughs> That's that's hugely powerful. Yeah, I think in a commander the, game, and at the same time, it's kind of trolly. Yeah. I, oh well, getting a free effect on every opponent's turn is definitely kind of trolly. <laughs> but uh, that might be something fun to try sometime. Just All like right. everybody gets a random free effect. So I'm guessing it is my turn for the next yeah. three now. All right. Yeah. Let's All see right. what we got. If you and your opponent had a plethora of creatures and you couldn't block any of theirs, would you rather play Wrath of God or Insurrection? Okay, oh, say that, oh, wow, okay, say that one more time. If you and your opponent had a plethora of creatures, and you couldn't block any of theirs, would you rather play Wrath of God or Insurrection? Oh, if I couldn't block any of theirs, but we both had a bunch of, oh, Insurrection, no question. <laughs> no question. Yeah, why would I, I mean, that that's a totally one-sided situation, you know? Yeah, I, I guess I should have said if your opponent had a plethora of creatures, and you couldn't block any of them. Hmm. And... Okay, well, that that it's, that it's becomes weird. a little more situational in the sense of you know, could I kill them immediately mm. with with an insurrection? I'm, yeah, I'm not. Or am I just trying to stop just, hemorrhaging? <laughs> yeah, I'm just trying to. If I can't kill them, then I gotta go with the wrath of God. Yeah. If I can't kill them, I gotta go with the wrath of God. But if you know, insurrection is such a powerful effect that you know that's sometimes you could even kill them before they can kill you. Yeah, that that's well. I mean, insurrection is meant to be a game ender. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I I either end the game with insurrection or I would go wrath of God. 
because then yeah. you, sometimes you just need the reset button if it's if the insurrection isn't going to work. Yeah, it wasn't the best question I had. No, no, that, that that's an interesting scenario. Yeah. All right, this one's very simple. Okay. Would you rather play Jace Memory Adept or Chandra Pyromaster? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I think that's heavily dependent on the kind of deck. The kind of deck but I'm they're playing. both like one is anti cards, the other is getting cards out. For free. A- anti cards. Yeah, memory adept anti cards. <laughs> I guess, well, yeah, okay, I guess I guess that's anti cards. We just established that's kind of anti card. Well, but it's also, I mean, it, you can it's, get some card advantage off yeah. of that as well. Mm, and Chand- but, uh, Chandra Pyromaster, you can get out a bunch of stuff. Realistically, I think my answer to that is both. <laughs> I'm putting together an Izzet deck and running them both. Yeah. Um, but no, I mean, in, in their respective decks, they're both like, powerhouses. But like, which one would you play first? First, ooh. Like, assuming I was going to build around them? Or just... Uh... No, just like if you had both in your hand at the same time. Oh, so I've already got them both in the same deck. Mm-hmm. Oh, well. Um, I'm going to go with the really safe answer here and say I would play Chandra first because that mm. way it'll curve out. She costs yeah. four and Jace is five. So Chandra, turn four, Jace, turn five. <laughs> All right. <laughs> or that turn, turn three and four with a mana rock. Yeah. <laughs> and... Uh, yeah. And well, and because then you know, I also have the option of zeroing Chandra the turn mm. afterward to see if I, I get something else that I would want to cast before going with Jace. Yeah, so yeah, I think that sounds like a good. Answer. I think Chandra would take the priority there. And another one. This is mostly just preference on which you would choose again. Okay. For counting life totals, would you rather use a non-spin down D twenty, four D sixes, or two D tens? <laughs> <laughs> um. <laughs> Well, lately I've been doing it. Oh, God. you said non-spin down D twenty. Yes. Oh, that's annoying. <laughs> that is so annoying. Oh, I'm gonna go with two D tens. Yeah, because you show the numbers and yeah. it would actually look like the number. Yeah, and I've actually that that's been my preferred method in the past. Lately, I'm mm-hmm. doing spin down twenties just because that's what I happen to have on me. But yeah, yeah when I when I'm doing it with dice, yeah, that, I'm gonna go with two D tens because mm-hmm. I like to gain life. I like to get up above twenty right. or or forty if it's a commander <laughs> game. You know, I. I like to get it trying to get into the hundreds. Yeah. I like to add that third D ten there so I can say, all right, I'm gonna I'm gonna go into triple digits here. <laughs> yeah. All right, well I okay, so that that was your That was my That was your next category three. three. Okay, well I'm down to the last two. And the mm-hmm. reason I kept it with two is because I'm I'm gonna think it a little more complicated now. Oh now I'm getting like outside the box here, okay? Okay, so here's here's my next moral dilemma, would you rather mm. for you, okay? Uh, let's assume you won something like an invitational mm. and the prize is that you get to help design a card. Okay. Ooh. So you, you get your input on this. Would you rather allow them to take the lead on what the card does and all the strategy of it and its mechanics and effectiveness and, Make it a creature card with your likeness in the artwork oh. so that it was a card that looked like you. Now I'm thinking solemn simulacrum. In, well, sure, but it's, it's yeah, but it would, but this is, imagine this is like some really, really spectacular, epic piece of artwork that looks like, it looks like the greatest photograph of you ever taken, but you're a <laughs> painting of like, you know, you're, oh you're riding in on a Pegasus holding lightning <laughs> bolts or you with... <laughs> something something really spectacular and it's like this great epic piece of artwork with your face on it and you're looking savage you know or, or that's option one or would you agree to total anonymity for having NP- any input in the card so in other words no one would know that you had any input in this card and you would agree to that anonymity in exchange for getting to make the big, powerful effect or mechanic that you have always wanted to see in the game. Second one. Really? <laughs> yes. Oh, you know, I don't know why, but that makes me really proud of you for some reason. <laughs> it's because, it's like, I don't have the best face out there. <laughs> oh, oh, stop. <laughs> <laughs> People say I'm pretty, but it's like, eh, I'll, I'll not have my face on something. Well, I know you've never been terribly, like, uh, you've um, never been very vain or, <laughs> no, or, or, or no. self- uh, self-oriented I'm an introvert, introvert. <laughs> yeah, yeah I'm very introvert so you would rather have like the input on the strategy yeah it. yeah because and- it would allow me to create a card that people will use and just I'll have say in the abilities mm-hmm. 
And who knows? It could be a totally broken ability in the end or one that's kind of meh. But yeah, and maybe someday I'll ask you to make that card too and <laughs> find out what it would be. I, I can imagine. I, I'll bet it would be a planeswalker. <laughs> but <laughs> It might be a planeswalker. <laughs> yeah, I, I think oh, if, I, if I had a card that I could, I, I would probably design a planeswalker. But all right, yeah. so that was an interesting you've already one. De- you've already designed two planeswalkers after yourself. Oh, I, I've designed my own cards. Guru Power Gamer. Oh, I gamer. guess I did. Okay. Guru well. Power Gamer. Because and... <laughs> The game rules guru. <laughs> because I am exactly that egotistical, I guess. <laughs> All right, well, I, I want to hear one of yours now, after that. All right. Would you rather play a simple, fast aggro deck or a complicated, slow control deck? Ooh, that depends entirely on my mood. <laughs> entirely on my I lean towards slow control. I've done a lot of that. I definitely you're more into the mind games. Kind well, of I am, and I, I'm more into the interactions of the cards. I like to see mm. all the different things that I can do in a deck. I've been in situations where, you know, um, I've I've already won the game. I've I've clearly won the game like several turns ago, but I'm keeping it going and basically letting people live at my mercy <laughs> because I, I still, I'm curious to, to see what else I can get away with, what I can do, you know? And it's like, well, you know, I like my You don't rune. do that in Hearthstone, though. No, I don't do that in Hearthstone. No. <laughs> Let's not talk about Hearthstone in a magic no. pocket. <laughs> but no, I mean, like, I've been in a situation with, like, a Blink deck, you know, where oh. it's like, okay, right now I can counter any spell repeatedly. I can steal any permanent I want on the table at any point. I can exile any creature. Uh, mm. If there's anything in a graveyard, I can get rid of it. Um, I can, I'm gaining a ton of life every turn. Uh, let's, you know, nobody can touch me. No one can attack me. No one can target any of my permanents or me. And so let's see just, what else I can get away with. So <laughs> you're just, so you just play God for a bit. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And it's like, and nobody can combo out on me either. I can prevent that from happening either. They can uh, even try a storm effect and I can stop it from happening. You know, it's like, and, it's, and so I, I get to a point where it's like, well, I know I've got this in the bag. I just want to see how many more things I can throw onto the table, you know, because you know, when you're, when you're having fun, you end up in that kind of situation. Yeah. So I think I'm, I'm going control mm-hmm. on that one. All right. Sometimes I do like an aggro deck. Like if I'm in a tournament, like a, like a one-on-one really fast tournament with like, uh, or a long tournament, like something really competitive with something on the line, you know, then, mm. then I might lean toward aggro, like put the pressure on and mm-hmm. get the wins, you know? But uh, if I'm just having fun, yeah, oh yeah, control strategy. All right, my next question I'd rather save for last. Ooh, all right. Well, okay, my 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 next one is my last one, and it's it's a long one, so I'm gonna try and uh, and this is this is not really a would you rather. This is more of a I'm giving you options. Okay. I'm giving you some options here. Okay, and I'm really gonna set this up. Okay. So yeah. this this is gonna be really specific. Okay, let's now. I, I guess the the tournament that you're in here. Doesn't really matter, but we could say, I mean, we could get really specific with it and say, okay, this is a seven round Swiss tournament and only people with, you know, the bare minimum to make the cutoff for the next round is like five, one and one record. And this is now you're currently sitting at five and one and you're going into the last round. So, you know, and the person agrees to, not, they don't want to intentionally draw. So you got to get a win to move on. Right. We could get that serious. <laughs> or you could just say, okay, you're in a game. <laughs> but here's the situation. Okay. All right. Your opponent is at six life. You are at seven life. Your opponent has one creature on the table. It's a four or five creature with no special abilities. It's just a four power, five toughness. You know that over the course of the games you've played... He's holding a giant growth effect of some kind. You don't know okay. if it's in his hand or not. You just know it's in his deck. Something mm-hmm. that'll put three extra damage on board. Um, he's currently got three cards in hand. You have no idea if that giant growth effect is in there or not. If it is, they could swing with the four, put the giant growth on it, kill you. Because you're at seven. So that's the scenario. Ooh. It's your turn. And what you have in play is a 2-2 two, two indestructible creature a 3-3 three, three indestructible creature, and a 4-4 four, four creature with no special abilities. And remember, they're at 6 life. You have burn spells, direct bit damage spells, in your deck, but you currently have none in your hand. Mm. You've got, maybe, let's say, we'll, for the sake of argument, we'll say that you've got 6 burn spells left in your deck. You know you've got at least 6 burn spells left in your deck. So, here's the question. 
do you alpha strike right now and attack with all three creatures? Do you attack with just your two smaller creatures, the two indestructible creatures, the 3-3 three, three and the 2-2? Two, two? Or do you attack with a 3-3 three, three and the 4-4 four, four and leave the 2-2 two, two behind? So you either attack with all three of them or you're attacking with two and leaving one behind. Mm. Now here's... The, and now uh, I think... Now I kind of rationed out how I would do this in your head, but I'm going to give you some like extra... Like to just fill it out a little bit more and let you know. Mm. Okay, so if you alpha strike, here's the situation. Your opponent is going to have to block the 4-4, right? Mm-hmm. Otherwise, they die. Yeah. They have to block the 4-4. There's no other scenario for I mean, barring any extra removal spell that they might have, uh, but you're very confident they don't have anything like that. They're not holding a fog effect, you know. So just with, with the information that we have, you know they're going to have to block the 4-4 or die. That means the 3-3 three, three and the 2-2 two, two are getting through, but that leaves them at one life. And okay. you completely open. Yeah, I, I thought about that. So they would survive. They will survive. You will lose your 4-4 creature. There's no way around that. And there's that. a possibility that I could lose immediately. And there's a possibility they could giant growth their creature and kill you on your next turn. So that's that's what's happening with the Alpha Strike. Mm-hmm. The next scenario, you attack with a 3-3 and the 2-2 and you leave the 4-4 behind. Now, they're in a situation where they can block either one of them and everybody lives. They're obviously going to block the bigger of the two. So you're getting two damage through. They would be at four, right? Mm-hmm. So... Now you have to think, well, it's going to be at least one more turn before I can kill them. And in that turn, you have to hope they don't put down another creature for a blocker. Because then you're not going to be able to turn them. Or you have to hope that you top deck a a burn spell to try and get rid of them. Right? Mm -hmm. For the sake of argument, let's say this is game three. You've each got one win and the clock is running down. So you know you don't have a whole lot of time to try and drag it out. You know, maybe you're in turns already. You know, so you can't really wait for two or three turns to do this. You know, you either got to win right now or on your next turn. So there's that problem. Um, Also, I mean, that ends up with another situation of, well, if they have something and they attack, I've got to assume they've got the giant growth. I'm going to have to block with the four, four and I'll lose it anyway. Um, But then that basically means, yeah, they're, they're done unless they then put down other creatures Okay, and the other scenario, you're attacking with the three three and the four four and leaving the two two behind because it's an indestructible blocker. Mm-hmm. Um, then they are definitely going to block the four four. It'll die. Their creature will live. They'll take three damage. They'll be at three, and that gives you the possibility of drawing a a direct damage spell that'll do three to them. Wait, so you said they were at six. They were at six, but if you attack with the three three and the four four, they block the four four and three damage is coming through. That will leave them at three. Okay. Yeah. So there's no way you can kill them right now. That's that's the main thing to remember. There's no way you can kill them right now. So what option do you think you're going with? You definitely want to attack. You've got to get mm-hmm. them down. You've got creature advantage on them right now. I would go with the last option. The last one. So you're attacking yeah. with the three three and the four four and leaving the two two behind. Mm-hmm. Okay. So you're you know that because like, I'm not going to lose any creatures. Well, yeah, you will. Besides you'll, you'll lose the, four, the you'll lose the four four. four, four. But I'll still have indestructible creatures out, but right. I'll still be doing damage to them, and I can keep attacking, and they're going to have to keep blocking. Okay. So, yeah, in and that scenario, in that scenario, well, if we go with that, then you attack with the 3-3 three, three and the 4-4, four, four, they block the 4-4, four, four, you lose it, they take three damage, they're at three. So now the situation is, they can't attack you and win, even if they're holding a giant growth, because you've got a 2-2 two, two indestructible blocker back. They're at three damage, which means you could top deck a lightning bolt or something and win immediately mm-hmm. without attacking. And if they don't top deck another creature or some kind of spell that'll that's capable of getting rid of indestructible creatures, then you can attack on the next turn. They're still not going to die, though. They'll end up, they'll have, they'll block the three, they'll three. They'll end up at one. They'll end up at one. So you'll be in the same scenario as the Alpha Strike, but you'll need two turns to get them unless you top deck the direct damage spell, Mm -hmm. but that does give you the opportunity to win by drawing the direct damage spell on top of it. Okay. So that's the one that you're going with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I, uh, 
I, I had to tough. think that yeah, that, that's a tough one. I wanted to I wanted to put that scenario out there because I think it's pure game theory. It's a mm. pure game theory scenario. And game theory kind of posits uh that whatever outcome there, there there's always gonna be a finite number of outcomes that you could choose from, uh given the right parameters. You always want to go for the one that's got the greatest chance of success, not necessarily the one that could give you the greatest result. So the greatest result from all those three options is getting them down to one life right now. But the trade-off is you might immediately lose the game. Yeah. Right? <laughs> so that's the trade-off. Now, if they don't have that giant growth, they don't have any way to kill them, you know you're going to win on the next turn. But unless, you never know. Well, unless they top deck another blocker, and now they've got two blockers that are probably going to be bigger than your guys... And then you're not getting through. Then you got to hope you top deck that direct damage. Um, mm. And the immediate big drawback, you might lose because you know they've got giant growth effects. Yeah. Right. So the other one being, you know, the other two being, I guess, that, well, you can do less damage to them and hold something back and guarantee that you will survive. Now, in one of those, the one that you're blocking is a 4-4, which means if they do attack, you're going to lose the 4-4, but they're not yeah. going to attack unless they know they can kill you immediately. Mm. And that and that's kind of desperate because or if they have some other way of uh you know stopping your attack the next turn. Um so that's a difficult scenario. But it, yeah, yeah, I think you definitely I think you want to go with the option that you chose. Yeah. Because you're getting rid of half of their life which puts them in a burn spell range. So you could win by top And I decking. can just block the creature. Yeah. And it doesn't have trample. It's not the best effect, but it's the best, safest effect. Mm -hmm. So, eh, I mean, it depends on your style. Maybe you're just like, no, oh, Leroy Jenkins. And you just go, <laughs> you know, whatever. But <laughs> I'm more like that in laser tag. <laughs> okay, so that was my final, that was my final Mine uh, scenario. Mine is so. very simple. Very simple? Okay, we're going to end in a simple one. All right, go for it. Would you rather play Modern, Legacy, or Commander? <laughs> <laughs> Commander. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I'm like, now, I, I like all of those formats. Because um, they're the eternal formats. Yeah, yeah. Besides and, vintage, but no one likes yeah, vintage. Yeah, and I had a lot of fun doing Modern. Uh, I, think, I think the constructed formats, all of them, tend to stagnate every now and then in terms of of the the meta game like you'll you'll see the same deck showing yeah. up over and over but and over commander again commander doesn't really stagnate commander doesn't tend to do that i think yeah. it does sometimes fall into the pattern of well we know that everybody's just going to develop 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 and then somebody combos off and wins yeah. that that's kind of what happens in the really competitive thing but at the same time commander is such a more it's a it's a more casual format yeah. even when you're finding tournaments for Commander, people tend to take it a little more casually. Not only is it the most fun way to play, in my own <laughs> humble opinion, but it's it's one of the ways that encourages the more most diversity in your play style. Yeah. It encourages the most use of cards and the most odd interactions. I do. It's the best way love to play the big powerful Commander. cards. Yeah, Commander's an excellent way to play the game. Because you get so many cards in a deck, but only one of each copy, unless it's basic yeah. land. I have been thinking more and more about doing some legacy. I think. Really? I can, yeah, I, I don't. I don't typically play Legacy because even though I've been playing for a long time, this is the first time, time I'm hearing this. <laughs> oh, well, you know, I, and I used to play Legacy. I, I used I know, to, I definitely but... used to play Legacy. But the problem is, even though I've been playing for so long, it's like there's so many cards in the game now, and there are well, very course. defined strategies in Legacy. And even though I have most of the cards for it, I might be missing like one or two guards for a very important deck. But you're talking. That's a six hundred dollar investment, you know, and uh, I'm not ready to drop a couple hundred dollars on a card, you know. So I'm never gonna do that. <laughs> Just, there are better things to. You spend win a billion on. dollars tomorrow. You're never gonna drop two hundred dollars on a magic card. Actually, I think I might. I, don't know. I think I might. I, I, I don't might, know. but I'm mostly gonna <laughs> save that for for but, video games. Yeah, but I mean, there is there is really something to be said for. Being on a budget to the point where you know you have to be creative with your strategies. If you could afford every single, and maybe this is a moral topic for later, you know, oh. but if you could afford every single card in the game and you bought four copies of every single card in the <laughs> game and you know you could put together absolutely any deck at any point, you know, I, I don't know. I think, I think That's the lure of the game weird, might though. actually lose a little bit. It might yeah. lose a little something for me because, 
you know, and I, I might actually try and invent my own format, like ways to play the game at that point, because knowing, and I don't know, I for might me, actually show become, up at different tournaments. It might but. become less interesting for opening packs. Oh, yeah, opening packs would lose all the lure completely if you had the money to buy any card. Yeah. No, just buy all the singles that you want. If you have the budget, I recommend doing that now anyway. Yeah. All right, so interesting. Yeah. Very cool. All right, so that was Would You Rather, <laughs> the Magic the Gathering edition Whoa. on the WMTG podcast. Oh, God. Yeah. And uh, all right, well, I had a lot of fun with this one. Yeah, that was and fun. We're going to come up with some more topics and maybe do this a few more times and maybe try and, uh, you know, the dogs have been nice and quiet for the past hour or so. <laughs> Hopefully yeah. they'll keep that up in the future. I guess we got to wait until the sun starts going down and then they... Uh, they quiet down a bit, or yeah. you know, mom gets home and <laughs> and they and they just snuggle up to her. Right after they start the excited, they stop the excited barking. Mm. All right, well, this has been the WMTG podcast. I am Steve Winall. I am Allie Winall. And thank you much for listening. We will talk to you next time. Bye bye. See you later.